The following podcast is uh, quite a powerful one, um, and it's it, it's not the entire viewpoint of everybody in the E5 wider family. Um, this podcast is about alcoholism and addiction, and is just a very open and frank and honest chat between Paul Meenan and Dan Jackson, um, who have suffered from addiction or been an addict. And um, we apologise if this offends anybody, but it's a conversation that needs to be had. So brace yourself, buckle in, and thanks for listening. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another E5 podcast. <laughs> I can stop myself. Um, this is a serious one, so let's stop it. Um, I am your host. Uh, my name is Paul Mean, and thank you very much for joining. And I, I'm uh, going to start with another apology because, in every single one of these we do, we 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 should really say if you actually like these podcasts, please can you leave us a review? Can you subscribe? Can you click like or do whatever the mechanism you use to listen to these on? It would be much appreciated. My co-host today and back again. Dan Jackson, a.k.a. Dan the Engineer. Dan the Engineer. So, Dan, me and you have um, we've done we've done a few podcasts now. We've spoke about various bits, put the world to rights, fire, etc. And a few other. Um, one of our more recent podcasts was one on um, depression, because, as you know, we've done one on bullying. Um, and I think one of the subjects that we kind of chatted about off air was alcoholism. Yes. And it's, um, it's a topic that really hits home for me. And, um, yeah, I've, I've spoken about this on social media before, so I thought it would be a good, it, yeah, I, I think it would be, um, good to talk about it on a podcast because it affects a lot of people. And, um, so I'm just going to go straight into it, Paul. Um, I'm an ex pisshead. Full stop. Um, I haven't drunk alcohol now for I think it's five and a half years, something like that. Not not literally alcohol at all. And the reason I stopped drinking alcohol is because I developed problems with alcohol that was affecting my home life. Um, I was doing really, really, really stupid things. Um, it's, it, you know, obviously it was a course over a long time and once I kind of stopped, it completely transformed my life and now I don't drink alcohol. The way I see the drinking culture is really, really damaging to, to society. There's, I, I'm just going to be completely blunt. Anybody who promotes drinking alcohol is a good thing. I can't fucking stand. Like, full stop. I will never endorse it. I don't think it's okay. And that might seem quite harsh, but that's because from my perspective, and it is my just opinion, I, I'm, I, I'm fine with people having conflicting opinions. That's fine. Um, but, you know, it's just what I was doing. And I see so many other electricians in the same boat as what I was in. So <clears throat> the things I was doing, I was um, lying to my partner at the time. I was saying I'm at work when I was down the pub. At the, but to be fair, well, I'm not not to be fair, but I was working. I was growing my business at the time. I was incredibly, incredibly stressed with work, and um, I've I've always drunk from a young age, Paul. Like literally, 13 years old, I was bringing bringing vodka into school, um, and I've always always drunk from a teenager. And when I was working around the country, when I was an apprentice, all we done was drunk growing up, going out in Croydon and places like that, um, just drinking all the time. And um, my, I had my first child, um, my daughter, and um, my wife was really, really struggling at home. And this, even when she was like a newborn, she was really, really struggling. But I was struggling too, because I was struggling okay. with the pressure of work. I was struggling with the pressure, pressure of becoming a father, and I was drinking. But at that point, I was literally, sorry, Carol, I, was, Carol. I was literally, all I, when I got to my office first thing in the morning, Paul, all I wanted to do was get home to have my first drink. As soon as I got home, I had a fridge at home in the garage that Poppy didn't know about. 
um, that I didn't, she didn't know I had beers in there, I would grab two Foster's cans, I'd put them into the freezer, I'd go and have a shower, and by the time I come back, they were cold enough. So when I take one out, I'd swap it with another one. I'd keep alternating it, and I'd do eight, 10, 12, whatever, a night, literally a night. And um, this is really, really, really hard for me to say, because I'm completely ashamed. So I, I was drink driving. Oh, fucking hell. And <sighs> I don't know, you know, anybody who drinks drive is a fucking arsehole. I was a fucking arsehole. Yep. I could have killed somebody. I could have killed myself. I could have made my daughter and wife at the time, you know, have financial problems because of my actions. I could have done that to somebody else. I was a fucking arsehole. And the rate I, one night she, um, I, I said I was working late commissioning a fire alarm system. I wasn't, I was down a pub with my mate drinking eight pints and um, I, I come clean with her and she basically gave me an ultimatum. She said, if you don't stop, literally, that was your last drink. If you do not st stop drinking, full stop, she's going to take my child and she's going to leave me. So I had to listen to that. And that, that was my last drink, my last beer ever. And it was, it was hard obviously but being a tradesman when you're always with the lads you know you go out and you know i was you know i was a director of a company and i was running a team of electricians and i was always out with my mates and stuff like that when you stop drinking you're a complete fucking outcast and people say oh you can just have one though can't you just just one just yeah. one but the thing is some, someone like me with who has those tendencies one turns to two turn two turns to four four turns to eight and then it's a regular thing every single night. The, the trouble is, is, do you think um, there is a there is a social problem with hundred percent, hundred percent. There is a it's become a, a social norm. So okay, so I've worked in London for years. When I was on the tools, it was very much oh, lad, you, you you get the scrap money, go down the pub, la la la. And you know what? When I was younger, I used to uh, I used to drink. Yes um i you know i didn't i never liked alcohol it's, it's kind of weird for me um i would i've never had problems with alcohol but i've had a problem with alcohol um so i'm five of ten my brother above me sean is an absolute raging pisshead he'll hate me for saying this but he is and he's completely in fucking denial of it um if he gets a whiff of alcohol he has an issue where the minute he smells the alcohol he, he slurs his words so my brother will be stone cold sober He'll come out somewhere with me, we'll walk into a bar, and he will smell the alcohol. The minute he smells the alcohol, there is a chemical reaction in his brain, and he immediately starts slurring his words. He's that much of a pisshead. You know, um, his last time I saw him, his skin was yellow, um, but yet he's still in complete denial. I have watched my, when I was 10 years old, my Uncle Jerry, which is my mother's brother, I found this out when I was older, kicked in my front door drunk on my 10th birthday traumatizing the fuck out of me with my dad with a snooker cue going to the front door to beat him up no idea who any of these people were alcohol he's dead now a drink killed him um i have a major problem with alcohol because it's uh, there's been a lot of alcoholism in my own family it's yeah. fucking heartbreaking absolutely heartbreaking when i first met kerry she used to drink like a fish um, and I had to say to her when we first started dating, please don't because you're hurting me and I can't sit and love someone who hurts me. And in fairness, she did. She stopped completely. Yeah. Now I, I will, I will drink once, twice a year, at like at a wedding or something like that. Maybe a glass of champagne, even though I can't fucking stand champagne or wine. I find lager tastes like piss. Um, I don't, if I have a, if you ever see me with a pint of lager, it's not a shandy the lightweight pint so it's three quarters lemonade with just a little bit of lager in it to mix it up um i don't mind spirits if they are for me if you're going to drink something you should have flavor to it should have taste to it um and not much alcohol really does it for me at all um but i mean i was on holiday last the other week and i had a uh, whiskey and a coke um and that was it that was it that's probably the first drink i've had this year to one of you i don't need it i don't need alcohol and alcohol doesn't need me, but you're right, because when I was on the tools, it was all about the lads venting. 
this comes yeah. down to what we spoke in our last podcast about the divorce rates. When people, I don't know why, and 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 tell me if tell me if you think I'm mad here, but I find people use going to the pub as a coping mechanism to change yeah. their personality. And then they can be a bit of a dick and think everybody will accept them for it because they were drunk. Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, because the excuse of, oh, you know, I had a couple of drinks, so, you know. Bullshit. Do you know what the worst thing is? I've got absolutely tanked off my tits, right? I have. In in years gone by, I've got tanked off. Do you know what happens when I get drunk? I get more fucking serious. I used to go out with my mates when I was 19 years old to like clubs and stuff and get really heavily drunk. And I was like a bodyguard. So anytime one of my mates was getting beaten up or whatever, I'd be like the bouncer in the club dragging these blokes out. And it was insane. I got, I found I was more attentive and more aware when I got drunk. Everyone's going to think I'm a right fucking weirdo now, but it's true. Um, and and I, when I saw what it was doing to my brother, um, I just stopped. But I never had an, a problem with alcohol. Thankfully, thank God. Because I watched the lessons um, that were laid before me by my other members of family, um, but it sounds like you've had an awful time of it. I, I used to get very aggressive, especially as a you know in my late teens, early twenties. Mm-hmm. Very, very aggressive. Um, I'm a completely different person now. I mean, don't get me wrong, aggression. You are super now. chilled. Yeah, I am super chilled. Um, and I think you know I think maturity is part of that. But as a, as a, a youngster, testosterone flying around, a lot of sexual, you know, desire and stuff like that. But yeah, I was, you know, I had some good times obviously with my mates and we had a good good old laugh. But I just think, you know, when you add alcohol, you, you obviously it distorts the way you act, your actions, and. Um, yeah, I, I should probably add to that, actually. You're right, it does. For some people, it can make them just not even remember the day after. I have never experienced that ever. But I know with some people, they genuinely don't remember what they did at all. And I think that's just maybe how your metabolism, how your body, your, yeah, your biology it, deals with it. Of course. everybody's. I mean, Paul, I've done it. I went, I worked on a Saturday once in an office. Yeah. Uh, still pissed out my face from the night before. And then went and worked there the following week, and I wasn't pissed. And um, I was like, who are these cables here? Like, done loads of first fixing. And my colleague was like, that was you last week. I was like, really? Electrical I, safety, Paul. Electrical safety. Mate, <laughs> I have worked. I have gone into jobs, and this is no word of a lie, and I've met the guy I've been working with, and he might be, a, he was probably older than me at the time when I was on the tools, and they, they stunk of booze. I mean, stunk. And I remember once I walked into, and this is on the tools and in offices, I once walked in, into a, a job where the spark who was working with me reeked of booze, was red in the face, and I turned around to him and I said, dude, you absolutely stink of it. And he went, oh, right. And then he got some like deodorant out of his bag and sprayed himself to try and cover it up and got loads of... But he, I, I knew straight away I was doing all the work. I was doing the lion's share of the work because I'm not, not letting him near anything. Stupidly, in them days, I didn't really know about, you know, sending people home and raising it up to your bosses. I was too naive. Um, but I've been in workplaces where I've literally sat there and the, I was the first person in the office. I remember one bloke walked in and he literally took his jacket off. And I'm, thankfully, he's not listening to this. And he left work on a Friday. This is a true story. And he took his jacket off his trench coat and he had probably about 10 grand in 50 pound notes. He'd gone to the pub on a Friday night, then to a casino and had spent the whole weekend in a casino till Sunday night where he decided to stay a little bit longer and then walk into work on the Monday off his tits. He stunk of BO and alcohol. And I literally had to walk up to him and he went, yeah, look at all that money. He went, mate, put it in your pocket, go the fuck home. Because if one of our managers walks in here, they're going to stink, smell you from across the room and you are going to be pumped so fucking quick. Your feet won't hit the floor. Take your shit and go home. Um, I'll happily tell him that you were in and that you weren't feeling very well. And he literally then went to the toilet for four hours where he fell asleep. On the toilet. And then I saw him four hours later and went, what are you doing? He went, oh, I fell asleep in the toilet. I went, go the fuck home. Um, and a true story, that happened. Um, I remember at one company I worked for where they were doing drug and alcohol testing because it was a railway. And I remember the nurse came into the offices and somebody shouted out, drug and alcohol testing. And a, um, a percentage of the office got up and left. Yeah, I bet. Um, and I've never understood that because you work in railway, you just stay away from booze. There are too many defined rules 
um, to, that say stay away from it. But when you go on the trades, it's a lot of them use alcohol as a coping mechanism for their depression with their wives, their families, and and because of the and macho bravado. Yeah, and also it's just it's culturally acceptable in our country. It, it's I go on holiday to have a drink. You know, I go away with the lads. We have a drink. Um, it, it's the culture, and it's just completely accepted. Like because I don't drink alcohol at all. Yeah. And um, people always be like, "Well, don't you have fun?" And it's like, I know it's embarrassing honestly, when they say that. That to me, that is so sad that someone yeah. can't have fun without having a beer. But the thing is, when when you when you do drink, um, oh sorry, should I say you stop drinking? Your world completely opens up. And you realise that you can do, you can still go out with your mates. You can still go out to bars. You can. You know, there's so many. There's loads of, in London. There's loads of um, non-alcoholic bars these days. And it's the social aspect. You don't need to have alcohol to have fun. It just masks a lot of stuff. And in my opinion, obviously, it, it causes a lot of problems. I know a lot of guys who end up having barneys with their misses um, because they've got drunk and they you know, obviously just taken a few things out on her, said a few hurtful words, and it's a constant thing. It's like a mental bullying, constantly. We know, we've seen, Paul, lo loads of guys do it, especially on a Friday night or a Saturday night, on Twitter, have a few beers and start saying some stuff that they shouldn't do. And then, you know, the following week, they're apologising because they're like, oh, you know, it was the alcohol. No, it was you, you prick. It was you. It was your actions. We have to be responsible for our actions. And people just seem to think that they can just blame alcohol. I can blame this. I can blame that. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with you, to be honest with you. I, I've... And, and Paul, sorry, I, I know there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be really not liking what I'm saying. But you know what? I don't care because I, I feel that strong about it. Um, I, going back to my childhood days, my, well, when I child, my teenage years, which were awesome, I remember I had friends who had um, girlfriends and all that. And I remember uh, I was with my missus at the time as well. And I was always fiercely protective over my friends. Most people are. And I remember one of my friends had a drop dead stunning girlfriend. And I mean, she was like a celebrity. You know, she was like celebrity lookalike, absolutely stunning. And I remember every time we went out, she used to get mobbed by pervy teenage lads. My mate didn't give a toss. He was too drunk out of his tits to care about anything or anyone. And I ended up having to do all the defending her honor stuff which I, I was embarrassed for her but I'm, I'm proud because she was a friend of mine but I was also embarrassed because my mate was just he weren't doing what uh, I consider a good decent man should be doing in defending his partner you know and making sure she's not been assaulted and it was alcohol it was always alcohol and this guy wrecked his his early career wrecked his university years with alcohol and it just it, it for me, I've always, when I've gone out, when I was a teenager, it was like, right, okay, well, I'm going to get pissed tonight. How do I control what I'm doing? How do I control my actions? How I was petrified of falling into a, I was always petrified when I was a kid of waking up in a gutter somewhere oh, and not knowing how I got there. I've done that a few times, Paul, believe me. Like, yeah. it's, my not great, mate. it's not my great, friend, mate. My friendship group um, at the time, it literally was just drink, 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 drink. I mean, don't get me wrong, a lot of um, youngsters these days, they, they're not they're not big into alcohol. Some are, obviously, but, um, it, you know, it's other drugs, you know. Yeah. But to me, alcohol, you know, because alcohol is legal, everybody seems to think that, you know, it's okay because it's legal. But, yeah, it causes more problems, you, you know, than a lot of um, illegal drugs. Well, I'm, uh, I'm addicted to the biggest legal drug there is. Sugar. sugar. Yeah. Sugar, exactly. Yeah, sugar. It's insane, it kills it? more people than anybody else in the world. Yep, it is. It is sad and and insane. So you've you've you struggled with it directly. I've always had a fear of it because I think of what happened when I was ten years old with my uncle Jerry. Um, it, it scared the hell out of me. And then watching my my brothers and stuff. Um, my dad would have killed us if he knew we were drinking as well. And it was all. It was actually a fear of my dad going absolutely ape. Um, of us drinking and and that all, as insane as it is it actually kept a healthy fear in me but for me alcohol one of the reasons i don't like it um and i think the bravado around it needs to just stop is because of living with it 
So my brother, um, I'm not going to mention his name. Anyone who knows him, who know who he is straight away anyway. But my brother is an alcoholic. Um, he denies it. He is. And over the years, I have worked my way off the tools into jobs where I've had very good salaries. Um, to be honest with you, every salary I've ever had, I've always been grateful for. And I have, when I finished, moved on from one job to another, I have not had a pot to piss in. And there's a reason I've not had, to pot, had a pot to piss in it, and it's because of my family. You you can never pick or choose your family, okay? And um, my brother, my brother Sean, just to just to be clear, I remember once getting a phone call from him. He'd been assaulted. He had, had his eye socket shattered. He didn't even want to go to the hospital. Um, and I then had to find, I had to take him home with me and put him up in my spare bedroom in my house. He lived with me for three months. And every single night after work, he went, out, he went out and got drunk. I had to drive all the way from Essex to London to pick him up from a pub somewhere where all he would do is abuse me, try and jump out of a moving car, get home. My missus would have a go at him or try and talk to him. He'd be abusive to her. And after about three months, it got to a point where he was drunk and he was having a go at her and he threatened her. And that was it. That was my blood pressure and the DNA numbers, red mist. And I dragged him back down to London, found a £25 a night hotel and put him up in it for six months. Mm. that costs a fortune but I had to do it to get him out of my house to protect my person I loved um, and to protect him and he, he unless you did everything for him he wouldn't do it for himself and it was a big mistake doing all of that because he got himself back on his feet he worked, he's an excellent um, carpenter by the way, world class when he's sober and this is what I love about my brother when he's working he never drinks but when he's not working he drinks and that's why he doesn't see himself being an alcoholic. Um, but he's self-employed, so it's 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 always jobbing stuff now and again. And if a job gets cancelled because of another trade, he isn't working. He isn't paying his bills. He's got a daughter. Um, he's had a lot of stress with the mother as well because it's obviously single parent um, issues there. He's not with the mother. Um, but I remember once he um, he rang me up, and he didn't really ring me up unless he wanted something from me. But he, he rang me up once. And uh, he said, oh, I've just got in touch with our mum. And I was like, wow, that's great, because I was the only one who ha had been in touch with our mum. And he decided to move in with her. Right. Three months later, my mum rings me up and says, your brother's on the floor, overdosed. Come and get him. So I had to go into London to pick my brother up off the floor who'd overdosed on drugs. My mum had this bag of drugs. OK, this is a true story um, that he'd taken with a whole load of alcohol. I immediately went to the toilet and flushed them. And she went, oh, he's going to be really angry. I went, I don't give a damn. Um, and I had to then take him to the hospital, have his stomach pumped, and then try and find a help centre for him. And that took me five days. The mental health places didn't want to see him. Um, you know, everywhere I went to, even Haringey Council refused to believe that he was a resident of Haringey Council, even though he was born and grew up in Haringey. And I literally had to say to the people in the in the help centre, do you want me to go next door to the school and get his school reports? Because he went to school there for fucking years. It was that stupid. Um, eventually, he did find uh, help with an Irish housing association, funnily enough. Um, and he lives in a bedsit and he's lived there now for nearly 10 years. Mm. And he still just gets drunk. So and it, it, it destroys you. Mentally, it destroys you. Financially, it destroys you. Um, emotionally it absolutely kills you because I'm under no uncertain terms um, when I was a kid me and my brothers and sisters used to think it would be our dad who we would bury first and I have said for a number of years now it will probably be my brother my my one up from me brother it will probably be the alcohol that kills him which is, yeah. which is horrific to say but it, it genuinely is true so I fucking hate alcohol because the thing, the thing is you know alcoholism is um, a lifestyle and it's never a healthy one it's never, you know, obviously drinking it alone is not good for you in terms of health wise. No, so. um, it's, a, it's a depressant and what it causes based on that, around that, it, it's a, and kind of um, going off the back of what you said with your experience. I think a lot of people who drink regularly and maybe in a little bit of denial that they've got an alcoholic problem um, don't really understand the effects of what they have of the people around them like um i know a lot of people who might you know it might be the father for example is a, an alcoholic and he treats everybody body like shit um and of course you know he doesn't really recognize that because he's an alcoholic 
and you know a bit of family suffer and everyone just kind of gets on with it as in like you know just brushes it under the carpet as if like it's normal but it doesn't have to be but it's not um the thing is though paul i've got it's tough because when you're in that situation where you have an alcohol alcohol problem it's not easy it's like any problem it's not easy i mean what i ended up doing was um i stopped drinking alcohol literally that night but i then developed a problem with drinking energy drinks as in oh god yeah literally it, it went from alcohol to energy drinks so i i would have two or three a day always one in the morning and then it would be as soon on my way home from work and one in the evening but after time that then turned to I, I managed to knock that on the head and i started drinking pepsi max and then i stopped drinking pepsi max and i managed to get um onto sparkling water and then i started drinking um proper juices like you know proper juice not you know the, the cheap stuff and then eventually it got to water but it was a long process it took more than a year to get to that point well well more than a year probably two years to get to that point and like, as you know paul like i drink water that's you know i drink a bit of coffee i drink um the odd flavored drink and stuff like that but generally speaking i drink water um but everybody's different in how they can adapt and and move on or, or overcome a problem um it's hard, i know it's very easy for me to say you know i don't like alcohol and everything i've said so far um but i also understand that it really isn't that straightforward and simple for people no. yeah people uh, it's a self-realization for me i've found with with members of my family the best um the best way of coping is to um is to is to walk away not permanently but to walk away and 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 just say look i can't i mean i acted like when my dad retired to ireland i acted like the bank of the family um you know they all knew i was on a on a good job so it was like right we're just gonna and they'll, they'll hate me for saying this if they ever hear these they will they'll absolutely hate me say how dare you say this in a public forum i don't care um the shit that they've they've put me through without taking responsibility for their own actions their own feelings their own problems that they created because the thing is is my when i got when i was a kid nobody helped me other than kerry it was just fucking do do or die you know succeed or fail and that's it but take the positives out of whatever happens successes or failures learn from the negatives um there are loads of people out there who want other people to do the work for them and i i, I know i'm probably not being fair because i know different people have different reasons for doing what they're doing i've never been an alcoholic um so i don't know and i i'm not going to offer a comment from an alcoholic perspective but from a family member of someone who is an alcoholic it is fucking soul destroying to have someone who you grew up with because i slept in the same room as my brother from the day i was born until 16 mm. when i moved downstairs when my sister moved out so even though we you know even when i talk to him he still says love you bruv and all that sort of stuff he'd, he'd always have me back it's heartbreaking it's fucking soul destroying when you've got alcoholism in your family and they can't be aware of it or they're not aware of it or they are aware of it and they choose to ignore it because they have to be strong for their kid or some other reason coping mechanisms well sometimes they can be great sometimes they can be an excuse or uh, just a, a delayer until our inevitable implosion yeah I, i'm a strong believer in if you're using anything as an escapism it's all you're doing is masking the problem again yeah without, without actually addressing it without doubt without doubt but i paul i honestly when i see um the culture or you know especially on social media of people like um i've had a really shit day so i'm gonna have these three pints in the next five minutes that sort of attitude I can't stand it. Honestly. Yeah, woke up, got wankered, went to work, got wankered again. Yeah, yeah, sparky life, no bollocks, twat life. Sorry. Yeah, I can't. Uh, I I have this weird problem with lager. Lager tastes like piss. Uh, if if I've never <laughs> tasted piss, just to be clear, but I've never found the flavour in it. I I liked it ever. I I always liked it. Spirits, yeah, but I I can't. I don't like it. I don't get it. I think, though, from an early age, I was conditioned to not like it. Um, I think probably that's why my brother gets annoyed when I talk to him about it, which is why I don't really talk to him about it anymore. Um, 
you know, uh, I, I still do speak to my brother. I, I actually took, funny enough, I took both my brothers to a Tottenham game um, a few years ago to the Ledley King testimonial where I wanted a day out with my brothers. Um, and I booked a table in the Pat Jennings suite, which is a really nice thing. Um, so that I could have some memories of me and my brothers, um, which was cool. Um, and they loved it. They all dressed up in shirt and tie. And, you know, it was a normal day until my brother got tanked up out of his face and started acting like an idiot, which took him about 40 minutes. Um, but yeah, it is what it is. You, you, they say you can't choose your family. Um, you just need, you need to know how to cope with them, I suppose. But in the trade, it's rife. Um, I think I've always said as a manager, if someone's drinking, I want to know why they're drinking. Um, if I can help them, I will. If they're drinking for the sake of drinking, then they get two options. Get help or get lost. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've had um, people work for me who have had uh, drink, um, drugs and gambling problems. And I've never been the one to kind of just go, right, that's it. You're dismissed, blah, blah, blah. I want to see if there's something that I can help with as an employer or a manager. Because sometimes as the company they're working for you're a contribution to the problem and i think you've got a, a social responsibility as a manager or a director of a company um and it's well-being and a staff isn't it it's we, uh, the biggest fallacy about health and safety is everybody talks about safety is in pp you got to wear it what about health yeah what about health how do you interpret that bit sitting at a desk for eight hours how's that fucking healthy it's not Sorry, Paul. Um, my my little boys. <laughs> this is for me. Hello, Wolfie. I'm just speaking to Paul. Can I put you back into bed? Let's go put you back into bed. Oh, bless him. Good night, Wolfie. Right, Paul, I'll be back in two minutes, mate. Go to sleep. Yes, put you back into bed, mate. Bless him. There is definitely something tapping on his end. Ah, he's back. Okay. And. Right, anyway, sorry, where were we? I don't know. <laughs> We were talking about alcohol and you just you just disappeared off of there to have a quick drink of water. Um, just while we're on the topic of alcohol and alcoholism and the various challenges, I don't want this to come across as we're belittling or judging anybody. These are just our personal experiences. You have been in the position of a person with problems with alcohol and I've been in the position of someone who's a family member who's an alcoholic. Um, and, and also, um, I just want to point out this, because I've been a bit vocal on social media about this before, I've had quite a few people come to me, talk to me about them having a problem. And right. um, just like anything, Paul, um, you know, us guys in the E5 group, we, we listen to a lot of people's problems. I will oh, listen. God, we do, yeah. Yeah, I will listen. If someone wants to come to me and talk to me, I will listen because I've been there, I've done that. I'm, again, I want to, you know, kind of um, expand what you said about we're not belittling anybody. Um, we all have our problems. Nobody's perfect because, you know, perfection is perception. But, you know, life can be tough. It can be really tough. So if you've got a problem with um, alcohol, um, you know, I, I, you can't be too harsh on yourself. But, you know, self-awareness is, is a great gift we can give, us, give ourselves, I think. Yeah, I agree. I agree completely. Um, the... <sighs> So just while we're while we're on this, because um, I know someone will probably or some people will probably think we're virtue signaling or some other weird fucking term that's completely irrelevant, um, although they see it on social media. Um, addiction's a big problem. Um, mm. I, I think loads of people in our industry have had their addictions and they've beat their demons. And to those people who have beat their demons, well done. Every day is a, another day. Um, just for those people who are still suffering, there is a, a fantastic amount of support services and networks out there now there's one called um drink chat uh, where you can go online and chat with an advisor there is drink line which is 0300 123 1110 9 till 8 every day and then 11 till 4 there is um an addiction website 
or Adaction website, sorry. There is Alcoholics Anonymous Great Britain and they have chat boards where people can support each other and their helpline is 0800 917 7650. There's, and again, I'm learning this, there's Al Anon, which is a worldwide support network um, where you yeah, can have a confidential that. helpline. There's Alcohol Change, NHS Comp Choices, AdFam. Now, this is one I'd never heard of. National Association for Children of Alcoholics, NACOA. Wow. 0800 358 3456. Information, advice, and support of children of alcohol dependent parents. It's, yeah, do you know what? Funny enough, when I was growing up, my next door neighbor was a constant prolific alcoholic to the point where she would buy, um, I think it was paraffin or whatever. She would drink paraffin. paraffin. Yeah, I think it was paraffin. Um, it was some sort of spirit. And she would, she would pour it through a loaf of bread to take the coloring out of it and then drink it. But it was like something stupid, high content alcohol. Yeah, she eventually died, funnily enough. Um, but she had two kids and they were the strongest people you'd ever met because she was never there for them. And they could see it and they just, they raised themselves. Um, but yeah, weird one. There's Alcohol Focus Scotland, 0141 572 6700. And of course, the Samaritans, 116123. And they're 24 hours a day and they'll just listen. Um, you can even email all these people now. So it's great that there's lots of different uh, support services that you can find and, and eventually you'll be able to find something that's prevalent to the challenges and the issues that you're suffering from. Um, because I, I, yeah, I mean, when they announced later opening for pubs and all the rest of it, I just cringed because they did that 24 hour drinking, didn't they? Yeah. And I cringed and everybody, everybody only cared about the statistics. And I just thought it's wrong just have some downtime have some goddamn off time do you know what i mean it's just maybe it's me I, I, again i can't speak i've never suffered from addictions apart from sugar and sweets and cake and shit really i can only talk from a depression perspective and, a, and an addiction i can't talk from a drug alcohol i'm too much of a coward i i've seen what it's done to the people around me i but um we all know people who have and dan well, yeah, it's, it's good. To, yeah, but it's good to talk to um, people with different perceptions on it because you know sure. diversity is really important. It is, and and in fairness to any of the people who have listened to our, we should add this to anyone who's listened to the bullying podcast or the depression podcast or this alcoholism podcast or addiction podcast. If you have a story you want to tell and you feel brave enough to tell it, or you think it might help people, come on and tell your story. Or, or message us. Um, um, we'll send you our phone numbers and we can chat directly as well. Um, but yeah, we well, I think the whole purpose of us talking about this is, is maybe this resonates with people and helps other people. What do, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I know I went in pretty hard with this one. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, cool, blimey. Yeah, yeah, no, but it's good. It's raw. It's real. And people need to realise that. But it's, it's, it's raising awareness that you know, we should address the elephant in the room, Paul. Yeah. You know? Well, uh, the elephant in the room, I thought, got addressed um, in, in one of the last podcasts when we were talking about depression, because the elephant in the room for me in the industry is, is depression, anxiety, um, whatever form it takes in people isn't being addressed by our industry. Yes, the electrical industry's charity are doing a great job. Yes, there's lots of support and help networks, but the cause, the root cause of these problems is not being dealt with. I know people are suffering from depression because their business is suffering because of the lack of available skills in the industry or the race to the bottom, or they're pricing jobs and someone who's just come out of college is pricing to do it far cheaper to gain the experience, which is harming some man's ability to feed his family. He then turns to alcohol or become it, it, it's it's deadly and there isn't again i've always said this our industry if you think the electrical industry is regulated then you are you are seriously deluded because it yeah. just isn't it is not regulated at all it just may want, be it may be soon in the future hopefully but it isn't at the moment just want to add to that though paul i, well, I don't this is, definitely isn't an electrical industry thing either like as in you know depression and and problems i think it's it's definitely a societal thing as well i just think that we see it more because we're in the electrical industry and we care about it but you know it, it's, it's hard because you've got to earn a living you've yeah got to earn a living. and who says that the grass is greener yeah 
it is hard. I've done jobs where I've just had to bite my bottom lip, close my eyes almost, and just suck it up. I hate to use that term, but I have had to literally just get to the end of the day because financially I needed to get my bills paid. I've had months where it's if I don't do this and I don't do that, my mortgage won't get paid. Um, in all fairness, though, I've never... I've never been in a position where I can't walk away because I learned my own value. And I have this term I use when I go speak to colleges and youngsters in our industry. The more you learn, the more you earn. Yeah, I love that. It's one of the reasons why we um, it's one of the reasons why we do these podcasts um, is to try and put some knowledge. Now, these these are not knowledge podcasts. These are thought pieces. These are. Uh, these viewpoints. Are ones, viewpoints. Yeah, they're viewpoints. So don't hate us for having a view. Um, come in and contribute or tell us we're wrong but um, they're hard they're hard to talk about I, I never ever thought for for I, I could tell you now I never ever thought I would ever record a podcast of me telling anyone about my dad or my feelings or any of that sort of stuff at all and you know what I'm I'm pleased I've done it I, I don't you know I don't feel any better for it but I'm just pleased I've done it um, and I want people to feel better about themselves one again one of the reasons uh, e5 for me makes me feel good and if other people can do stuff in the name of e5 that makes them feel good great but at the end of the day it won't be in the name of e5 it'll be in the name for themselves yeah and that's that to me is really important um i do think anyone who tries to manipulate e5 for their own gain will just hit a brick wall just to be clear um but well, they won't even get near E5, let's be perfectly frank, but that's just the nature of the beast. Eventually, people will realise what we are and what we're trying to achieve. Um, I think, unless you've got anything else to add, I think we're going to close this dark chapter. It's yeah. probably the least, the least listened to of them all, um, but hopefully someone listens to it, and it's worth recording it if it helps one or two people. Um, so, yeah. Dan, final thoughts? Just to recap, um, we all have problems, guys. We all have our own problems. Um, I'm just very open about mine in the past. So you're not alone. If, if I can say I'm actually proud of you, the fact that you've you've gone through that journey and you've come out the other side and you're still a ridiculously good looking fella <laughs> uh, and a lot going for you and two wonderful kids. Um, you're doing OK. You're doing well. I know. I know. I'm grateful for that good good right um okay and so that's it on alcoholism or addiction um sorry about the dark content of this but um sometimes you've just got to just be open and honest so until the next one which will be more cheery and a bit more technical and a bit more sad uh thank you very much for listening thank you very much for watching if you're on youtube please leave any comments um on youtube or email us info at e5group.org.uk Please leave a review on any of the platforms you're listening on. Please subscribe. Um, and we are grateful for you giving up your time listening to our rambling. And until the next one, take care of yourself and each other. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.